Good morning. Good to see each one of you that's here this morning. We're going to begin our service with uh, number 213, Because He Lives. And our, our Christian lives, the very reason we're here is because He's alive. Uh, we serve a risen Savior. So uh, let's sing the first and last verse of 213. if he would, to open our service in prayer this morning. Brother Wee. Most gracious Heavenly Father, dear Lord, once again I thank you for the beautiful day you blessed us with. Thank you, Father, for each and every one that made it out here today to be in your house. Dear Lord, continue to bless, lead, and guide us to our churches. Bless our young people, dear Lord, and soon be still with you. Continue to bless all these, Lord, and these young ladies that are Having little ones, bless the ones that will probably be born, watch over them, and let them be well. The Lord continue to bless our church family. In your precious name, Jesus, I do pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, folks. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see each and every one of you this morning. And if you're visiting for the first time or not being here in a while, it's great to have you with us this morning. We welcome you. In the way of announcements, uh, back to school bash, August the 7th at uh, 6 p.m. Also, the church is asking people to, uh, our homecoming is upcoming, and they're wanting to know some history about the old church. So they have formed a committee and if you have any information that you would like to share with this committee, uh, feel free to do so about the history of the Grundy Church of Christ. And that will be on August the 11th at 5.30. Are there other announcements? We're going to try to have them start finish the next Sunday. If you're not uh, noticed, uh, they're, they're working downstairs on the restrooms. So please be patient. 
and uh, the hopefully that like Roger said it will be completed by next Sunday so thank you for your patience on on that part there Today's broadcast Sunday broadcast Sunday okay thank you men will be at the door to take up the offering for the broadcast Sunday and again thank each and every one of you who have contributed to the broadcast it's a great ministry there are a lot of people that are shut in that can't get out and they listen to that broadcast daily and uh, again it's just a great ministry uh, to get the word out to those to a lot of people in the uh, way of prayer request uh, remember Pam Reif uh, she is going to start uh, the chemo and uh, the treatments here shortly Samantha Lee and her baby uh, the baby was born but it is still in the hospital and continue to pray for both and also Matt uh, the dad uh, so I'm sure that he is up in there too uh, anxious uh, not knowing so please keep the Lee family in your prayers they will try to take him off the ventilator He is in good hands at this time, though. Amen. So please, please keep the baby and Samantha in your prayers. Pauline Smith, uh, Bobby Hill, uh, Nancy Pruitt. There was two shootings recently, one in Texas and another one in Ohio. And please, please keep this in your prayers. I mean, it's uh, Dennis had a good lesson on it this morning about the way the world is turning now. And uh, it's just uh, the way the Bible speaks of it. That's right. So please, please uh, keep uh, that in your prayers and just pray that people can uh, hear the word. Again, uh, this uh, ministry, uh, the broadcast Sunday, or the broadcast every day, uh, hopefully it will get out, the word will get to some of these people. Have a change of mind, change of heart. So please, please keep... Uh, those two shootings in your prayer. Also, uh, Mary Beth Stiltner and uh, Kenneth O'Dell. And uh, please remember Donna. She had her MRI the other day, and she will see the doctor Tuesday for the results on that. Also, uh, Anthony Blankenship, that's uh, Roger's uh, son. And uh, Anthony Hurley, Donald and Kathy Hurley's son. Please keep uh, him in your prayers. Is there any other urgent prayer request you'd like to mention this morning? Mary Thornsbury. Mary Thornsbury? Did they take her back? <coughs> Mary had to go back to Duke, so please keep her in your prayers. Yes. Her cousin's on our mic. He got killed in a motorcycle. Okay. Yes. What was the name again? Pam McCoy. Pam McCoy. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Mavis Adkins, uh, yeah, she is always here, so please keep uh, Mavis in your prayers also. Anyone else? Cynthia Expressions, I had the families of Jerry Byers, June Osborne, Mike Scarberry, and Draxy Kennedy. Anyone else? If not, a prayer hymn will be number 461. And after we have sung the last verse, Brandon, can I get you to have prayer for these, please? Thank you.
as the assembly, as the body of Christ, to worship and praise you, to be challenged by your message, and to bring glory and honor to you. Lord, as we sing this song, He Leadeth Me, in order to understand as we sing that, we first got to realize we've got to follow you in order to be led by you. And that begins by opening up the Word, looking at the inspiration that you've given through these men, the twelve apostles, and opening it up and understanding that in order to follow the Good Shepherd, the Chief Shepherd, we've got to let you lead us by your Word, the staff. Lord, we, we do pray for those who have been mentioned this morning on our prayer list. Uh, many different names with different situations and problems in life. And we just pray, Lord, for each and every individual. We could spend countless time uh, going through each and every individual's issue. But, Lord, you know the problems. You know how to handle the situation a lot better than what we know how to do. And we do pray, Lord, that your will will be done in the lives of these people the ones that are hurting, that are sick, and that are fighting for their life uh, physically. But, Lord, I pray for their soul spiritually, that they realize that the importance of being healed is being healed spiritually rather than being healed physically because our soul is of importance. And I believe that the sheep here at the Grinning Church of Christ, their soul is of more importance than the physical body, Lord. And let us first realize that they have a soul that Jesus Christ bled and died for that we should put these sheep first. We do love and thank you. Most of all, though, we thank you for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Good morning, folks. Good morning. It's good to be back at the Lord's house this morning. Amen. I'd like to thank everybody on behalf of Matt and Samantha. Uh, I'm not to go out, got to go out there the last couple of days, but you just don't know what prayers do, you know. And to say that I've had a prayer on my lips since the day they minute he came in this world would probably be an understatement. He's all I got on my mind. But and I know that's taken away from some of the other things, but it's hard not to pray for a little one like that. And especially when he's part of your family. This morning, I'd like to read from Luke 22. And I'm going to point out a couple of things, and then we're going to walk through it and maybe give you a better understanding of what about the Lord's Supper is about. And he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. <clears throat> and he took the cup and he gave thanks and said, Take and divide this among yourselves. <clears throat> For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of this vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took the bread and gave thanks and break it. And gave it unto them, saying, This is the body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. Right up to the top, in verse 15, with desire. And he didn't, didn't say it once. He said it twice. So before Judas betrayed him, he desired to have this Lord's Supper with his closest and dearest friends. Before Peter denied him, he desired that. Before he prayed in the garden, he desired that. Before he stood in front of the high priest, beaten, suffering, and the worst was yet to come, he desired to have that supper. Before he stood in front of Pilate. Before the flesh was ripped from his back. 
before he died. Beard was pulled from his chin. Before he was spit in his face, he desired to have that Lord at supper with his closest. When he hung on the cross and the nails pierced his skin and the blood flowed from his precious body and the sins of the world was forgiven, when he arose in that tomb, he desired to have that. And here's the, the, the thing about it, folks. He knew all this was going to happen with desire. As we gather here this morning, do we desire that meal like he did? Is there thoughts on where it, they need to be? Is there thoughts on the precious blood that flowed for my sin? And, and I say this all the time. This has to be a personal thing. It has to be personal. He died. He suffered all that for me. And he desired that. You know, in the book of Acts, and I'm going to use this verse in a minute. They were, were, we were first called Christians at Antioch. We gather here because we are the children. We are surnamed after him. We are Christians. Together around this table shows him and gives us the opportunity to show him how much we love him. So long that took for that little sequence to happen there. But he only asked for just a few minutes of your time and for your mind to be drawn back to Calvary. Thank you. for each one of us to be here this morning. And just now as Christians, as we remove the thoughts of this world from our mind for just a few minutes, that we might focus solely upon the cross and see our precious Lord and Savior as he died the awful cruel death that through this we might have salvation. And as we take the bread, may we truly see his broken and bruised body and the cup representing his blood. And I just pray that you would spiritually bless each one of us in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
This morning I'm going to read from <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 16, 2. Upon the first day of the week, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you <clears throat> excuse me, lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gathering when I come. The simple question is this morning is why do you give? Do you give because it's a commandment? Do you give it because you feel it's a necessity? Do you give because other people give? Well, I'm going to tell you what God wants. God wants you to give because he loves you. Amen. He wants you to love him as much as he loves you. A while ago I said in the book of Acts, in the 26th, or the 12th chapter, 26th verse right at the bottom, and disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. I don't know if you've ever sat back to realize what your name is. You look around the room, you see all kinds of people. You see coal miners, teachers, merchants. Doctors, lawyers, cops. A pretty diverse group except for one thing in common. And that's Christ. Amen. Don't matter what your background is. Don't matter what you've done in the past. Don't matter what degree you have. God loves you. Amen. And he wants you to love him like he loves you. And if I could tell you every time I'm around my grandkids, they drain my wallet. They get two or three dollars every time they come around. That's about all I got in my wallet. I give because I love them. Amen. You guys know that. That's the reason God gives to us, because he loves us. And to give back to him is just love. It's nothing more. Amen. Pure and simple. Thank you. Father, we just don't understand how good you are through the blessings that we have and that we get each and every day of our lives Father I just pray that each Christian here today will look into their lives and help us as Christians to look to someone else that is in need Help us to be able to help one another to get through life here on earth. But most of all, that we can meet together someday in heaven. And I pray as we take up this offering this morning that it will be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom here on earth. And Father, as we've just heard this morning and last night of these awful, awful deaths done by these people that don't know you, Father, help us to be able to take and reach these people, no matter where they're at, what they're doing, or what we may be doing. Help us as Christians to reach out and to pass the love. Maybe it'll change somebody's hate in their heart. I just pray as we go through life that we can turn that hate around to love with the forgiveness that you have gave us. Bless this offering as we pass it on in your name, mm -hmm. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, girl. How many of you all remember James Hill playing that same tune? And at the end, he'd done that when the trumpet sounded. Did you, have you ever heard him play that? He does a little old jingle there at the end. It sounds like the, whenever the trumpet sounds. Uh, he was, uh, uh, James was a good piano player. Good to see everyone here this morning. Uh, it's a beautiful day out there, and we're looking forward to having a great day. And uh, Before we get into our message, uh, today is broadcast Sunday. Uh, and our radio broadcast has been going on for many, many years, uh, over 23,000 consecutive broadcasts, and uh, the elders here at Grundy uh, are over the broadcast, and uh, they're responsible for what uh, uh, takes place uh, on the radio, and we've got seven or eight different speakers, and uh, sometimes uh, whenever your week comes up, you forget, and I'm glad I've never done that. But uh, uh, sometimes you may be in the hospital with a family, uh, you may have a funeral, and uh, it's been made easier by uh, the radio. They've made it possible that we can call in from different places, and uh, still we've had a, a few uh, times that we've uh, uh, had to play music, and something other than uh, a gospel message has uh, been shared, but uh, starting uh, this Monday... Uh, we're going to ensure, and uh, the men here has already told me plainly, uh, that we're going to take a, a library of uh, CDs uh, down to the radio station, and if anybody's not there, uh, we'll have a recorded uh, gospel message uh, for the radio broadcast. And again, we appreciate everybody that has helped with that down through the years. And I know that there's some of you that listen to it every day. And uh, we have a responsibility to you, if you support that, to ensure that uh, there is a, a gospel message on every Sunday. So we're going to do our best uh, to make sure that that, uh, that happens. And uh, no more uh, music or uh, things that uh, we uh, don't like or don't approve of. So uh, we're going to try to take care of that. Uh, this morning, we're going to look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. Uh, and here in the book of Philippians, Paul is writing to Christian people just like you and I. And uh, we are uh, living in a time and a society that is uh, very different from other times and societies. Uh, and our culture is different than it was just a few years back uh, in our contemporary lives. Uh, so as we look at the scriptures here this morning, uh, we're going to look at the thought of the example that we should be of our faith. The example of Christianity that we should be to each other and to the world and examples of the Lord and examples of our faith. The scripture says, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Being an example of the faith or being a sample of Christianity. Let's pray. Father, as we come here this morning to worship, Father, it's good to be here and not be afraid, not be scared, not be worried, just here in peace to worship and honor you as our Heavenly Father. And to feel your love and feel your presence here with us this morning and feel the comfort and the hope that the scriptures bring to our lives, that your word and our faith uh, ensures to us of eternal life in a place where there's no hardships, no worries, no fears, no cares, no death. Won't even be any praying there for things that we pray for now. 
God, what a, what a land heaven must be. And I pray that you would help us to know how serious of a matter it is. To live our lives and be the example that you want us to be. So that we might influence just one person. To turn from the life that they're living to give their life to you and surrender to your power and your authority. Help us to know that every moment of our lives, every second that we live, we are being an example to someone. And we're representing our faith, and we're representing you and your son. We're representing the church in everything that we say and everything we do and everything that we think. Help us to be a good example. And Lord, I pray today that if there's one in this audience that needs to just be a little closer to you, and at the time of invitation, they would just step out and they'd walk down the aisle and say yes to you and to your invitation. And God, that we would all surrender ourselves and our wills to you, and we would just simply be what you want us to be. Go with us and lead and guide us. Bless this message. Bless your church, your people, everywhere that are assembled today to honor and worship you. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Paul says here in the first line of Philippians 1.27, let your conversation, and the way that we use that word conversation today is just, you know, our talk talking back and forth between one another, but uh, that word in the original language didn't mean conversation, talking back and forth to one another. Uh, it meant your citizenship or your conduct. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the American Standard translation, uh, when it was translated in uh, 1941, uh, instead of conversation, the American Standard has it, uh, only let your manner of life be as becometh the gospel of Christ. The New American Standard, uh, they translated it a little bit different from that. Uh, only conduct yourselves in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. And then the New International Version, Philippians 1.27 says, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner that is worthy of the gospel. So we can see and understand very plainly that this verse of Scripture is talking about our conduct, the way that we live every day. And Paul says that this conduct, our conversation, our manner of living, should be in a way that it uh, becomes, and that word becomes means uh, beautify or to adorn the gospel of Christ. Everything about our lives as a Christian should bring glory and honor to the gospel and to the church and to the Lord and to the kingdom and to our faith. Uh, we should never uh, be guilty of things that would uh, tear down what the Lord is trying to build up, his kingdom, the body of Christ. Now, conversation in the American standard, as we said, means our manner of life. And the word that Paul used in the original language means our, to be a citizen which means citizenship. Now, we're hearing a lot in our society today about citizenship. Uh, all of us that are here this morning, as far as I know, we're all citizens. We have citizenship in the United States. Now, citizenship means something. Uh, it's important. Citizenship is important. And the people at Philippi, they understood uh, that citizenship was important because Philippi was a... A colony of the Roman Empire. Rome ruled the world at that time, and uh, they, these people in Philippi, they were a Roman colony, and they were a little piece of Rome that was planted in another place. All of us as Christians, we're a little piece of the citizenship of heaven that's planted in a different place. Every one of us, our homes, is a citizenship, is a place that has been planted there in our communities to represent our citizenship in heaven to that community. In our workplace, 
our job. We have been placed there as a colony uh, to show our citizenship and represent our citizenship in our workplace, on our sports team, in our homes, wherever we're at. We are there representing our citizenship in heaven to a world that is not citizens of that kingdom. Now, Philippi was a colony and they were just a piece of Rome. And as Roman citizens, they had the privilege of and enjoyed all of the qualities of Roman citizenship because they were Roman citizens. They spoke the Roman language, which was Latin. They spoke the Latin language. And they wore Latin clothes. All of their officials, all of their leaders had Latin names. So their citizenship was very important. They knew the privilege of being Roman citizens. Now, it's important to be American citizens today because we have privileges. Uh, we uh, speak the American language, which is English primarily, but it's kind of turned into other things now. Uh, I think if uh, you're a citizen of a kingdom, you ought to be able to speak that language. Now, that's just a personal opinion. That's not a political statement. That's just my opinion. Now, uh, as Christians, and we're citizens of the kingdom of heaven, and we're citizens of the kingdom of Christ, and we're citizens of the kingdom of God, all three of them are the same kingdom, the body of Christ, the church. And every Christian must realize that being a citizen of heaven is much, much greater than being a Roman citizen or being an American citizen or being an English citizen or any other citizen. The citizenship in heaven, our belonging to that eternal city called heaven is more important than belonging to anything else in this entire world. So uh, realizing the tremendous privileges of a citizenship is also important. Now, as citizens of the United States, we have responsibilities. Without going into a lot of detail, what are maybe two or three of the greatest responsibilities that we have as citizens to our country today? What is some of our primary uh, responsibilities to our country as a citizen? Pay taxes. We don't like to pay taxes, but that's responsibility. Do we get any benefits from paying taxes? Why, well, sure we do. We get protection and help from the Army and uh, all the laws, and some of them we don't agree with, some we do, but uh, all of that is, is good, and it's for the benefit of the entire nation. So uh, we, we pay taxes uh, as citizens. We have a responsibility to do that for our own safety. And what else do we do as citizens? We vote, all right? What else responsibilities do we have? Obey the law. Now, is that important to obey the law and keep the rules? Why, sure. In any kingdom, in any place that there is a citizenship, that you have a responsibility to a power that is over you, then you have a responsibility to pay taxes, uh, to obey the laws, uh, to do the things that are responsible, and we could probably name hundreds of, of, of other things. But this morning, I want us to see that in the kingdom of God. We have the responsibility to pay our tithes. Do we get any benefit from tithes? God promised that he would open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing we couldn't receive. Uh, we have... Uh, people that watch over us as shepherds to watch for our souls. Yes, there, we have benefits of investing in our citizenship in heaven, the kingdom, the body of Christ. And we have tremendous privileges. We wear the name of Christ. As Richard said here earlier, we all belong to the same family and we get the benefits of that family. And uh, we wear the name of that family. Now, if you are a U.S. citizen... Don't you think you should be proud to wear the name American? Or wear the name U.S. citizen? I'm a part of the United States. So to be a Christian, we need to proudly wear that name uh, because we belong to Christ. 
Our citizenship is in heaven. Now, the manner of life that a Christian will live is either an asset or a liability to the cause of Christ. Now, in any citizenship here in the United States of America, every individual person that is in the United States today, they are either an asset to our country or they're a liability to our country. If you are not paying taxes, if you're not obeying the laws, if you're being detrimental to the society and the law that is already in place, then you're being a liability. If you're contributing to helping uh, propagate and ensure that this country continues to go forward as it is, then your citizenship is an asset. In the kingdom of God, you're either a liability or an asset. If you're contributing to God's kingdom and its growth and its ongoing, then you're an asset. If you're not, you're a liability. So as we look at that, our citizenship is very important. And Paul includes this word here in Philippians 1.27 to ensure that the Philippians understood what Paul was getting at. Uh, a sample or an example of their life was being exhibited to everyone that knew them, everyone that saw their lives, everyone that observed their conduct. People are watching your life. And Paul wanted them to know that you are representing Christ. They already knew that they were representing Rome by all the people that came from other places and saw their lifestyle, saw their clothing, saw their homes that was influenced by the Roman society and the Roman civilization, then they knew that they was representing Rome. Paul wanted them to know that you're representing Christ also. Regardless of where you live, whether you're in the last house in the head of the holler or you live beside the main road, you're representing Christ to everyone that passes by your way. And you're being a sample of what Christianity is. Now, one of the greatest forces of a salesman is to have a sample or an example of the product that he sells. Now, God sent his son, the Lord Jesus, here from the portals of glory, from the majesty of heaven. He sent his son here to convince mankind to follow God's word so that they too could go to that wonderful place called heaven. Now, Jesus was an example of God's love, love, his grace, and his mercy to mankind. Now, we can go back to our early days in vacation Bible school, our early days in Sunday school when we were just small children, and we began to hear about God's love, and we began to hear about Jesus, and we began to hear about the death on the cross. And as we formulate all of these thoughts and ideas into our mind, and as we grow in our knowledge of the Scriptures, we begin to see the complete picture that God wants us to know, that He sent His Son here to be an example of His love. Now, when we define the word love, if you'll look it up in the dictionary, you'll find two or three definitions, but you'll eventually come to a definition that love is unselfish. Love is for the other. The feeling that you have for someone else and want the best for them, they come before you do. Jesus left all that heaven is. I don't know what you think heaven is, but all that heaven is, God sent his son from that glorious, wonderful place to come to the earth, to be born in a manger, to be born in a stable and laid in a manger, a feeding trough for animals. Not a very sanitary place, not a world-famous hospital, not a palace, not with servants, but the best that God had, he sent it to the poor of this world to be a sacrifice for them. 
Does God love you? Is there any question in your mind that God has done more for you than you can do for Him? There should be no question on that matter. So God is giving us an example of how that we should love others. And then in the book of John, Jesus tells us to love one another as He has loved us. The other person should come first. If we love the way that God does and we're being an example to society and people around us, we ought to put the, the needs of others before ourselves. Now, sometimes that's the needs of your wife. Sometimes that's the needs of your husband. Sometimes that's the needs of your children. Sometimes that's the needs of your parents. Sometimes that's the needs of your workmates or your teammates. Sometimes that's the needs of your enemy. I heard one, mm-hmm, and not a single amen. <laughs> Jesus said to love our enemies. Now, that's not our choice, is it? He said if you're going to be an example of Christianity, you've got to love your enemies. When he came here and died for us, were we his enemies? Yes! We were all the enemies of God. The scripture says all the way back in the book of Isaiah, 750 years before Jesus came to the earth, that all we like sheep have gone astray, and everyone has went his own way. We've all become the enemies of God, and it took the blood of the Lord Jesus to bring us back into the family of God. So if we follow the example of Jesus, we'll love our enemies. How else are you going to win them back into the family if you don't love them? You can't hate them back into the family, can you? So if we are examples of our citizenship and examples of true Christianity, then we will be following the example of the Lord Jesus. God sent his son here to be a sample, to be an example to us how to live and conduct our lives and how to think and how to live in a wicked and an adulterous and a sinful generation. All the time that Jesus was here, after he began his earthly ministry and even before, there was plans on eliminating Jesus' life. In other words, they wanted to kill him. When Jesus was born, Herod wanted to kill Jesus when he was a baby. Now, you all have been praying this week for babies to live, haven't you? And babies that are not yet born, you've been praying for them that everything goes good and they're born healthy and they have a grow up and have a normal, healthy life. But when Jesus was born and they got news that Jesus was born, they said, we need to make sure that this baby's killed. Boy, that's awful, isn't it? And Jesus continued to live. And we meet when he began his earthly ministry. And it was known that he was teaching that there's life after death, that no longer you have to serve the Old Testament law, but you need to begin to follow Christ. And God has a new covenant that he's going to bring into existence because this Messiah has come to live and die for you. As we see all of that unfold, during Jesus' earthly ministry, there was people that wanted to kill Jesus. Now, I hope this is not news that's going to shock anybody, but there's people that wants to kill you today because you're a Christian. There's people in the world today that wants to kill anyone that is a Christian just because they're a Christian. So should we hide our Christianity? Did Jesus hide his work that his father sent him to do? No. Jesus continued all the way to the cross. And the Bible says that he uh, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He prayed in the garden, not my will but thine be done. So Jesus continued to do the will of the father and obey his citizenship that he had left in heaven and honor his citizenship by keeping the rules and the laws of the one that had the authority of heaven, his father, 
our Father, God the Almighty. Wow, that's big, isn't it? Now, as an example, Jesus did everything that was necessary to please his heavenly Father. Even though it was against his will, and even though it was against his wishes, did Jesus want to die? Now, Richard shared with us a thought here this morning in our communion meditation that before Jesus went to the cross, he desired to keep that last meal, the Lord's Supper, with his disciples and institute the new Lord's Supper, keep the Old Testament Passover and institute the Lord's Supper. He had a desire to do that. That was a desire that God sent him here with to do to institute this new covenant with mankind that through his blood our sins would be forgiven. Jesus desired to do that. Had a great desire. And the scripture says, with desire I have desired to eat this meal with you. Emphasizing the importance and the necessity of it. But as we think about that, when Jesus got to the cross... Did he want to face all that he was going to face in the hall of Caiaphas, the high priest, in Pilate's hall, in the presence of the Roman soldiers? Did Jesus want to face that? No. He prayed in the garden the night before he was rested and he prayed so seriously and he prayed so uh, fervently and he was so um, filled with emotion and overcome with anxiety and overcome with worry and hurt within himself that the scripture says his sweat became as great drops of blood falling to the ground and he prayed, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass. In the human body, Jesus didn't want to endure all the things that he was going to endure. He didn't want to be spit on. He didn't want to be hit in the fist with someone's fist. He didn't want to be slapped. He didn't want his beard to be plucked out of his face. He didn't want those awful thorns crammed down on his head and then hit over the head with a read to drive them in deeper. He didn't want to feel that scourging whip go around his back and jerk off pieces of flesh. He didn't want those nails driven in his hands and feet. Jesus didn't want that. But he submitted to the authority of the one that was higher than him. And he said, Father, not what I want, Not what I will, but what you will. God's will and his plan and his love and his desire for you was that Jesus would suffer the pangs of death and sin in your place and in my place. That's what real citizenship means. Jesus was faithful to his citizenship that was in heaven. Whatever the laws and the rules of heaven required, Jesus submitted himself to those rules and those laws. And that was to the will of his Father, the same Father that is my Father and your Father. Have we submitted to the will of the Father? To the point that we make ourselves do the things that the physical body don't want us to do. The Apostle Paul struggled with that, didn't he? Paul said, sometimes the things that I should do, I don't do. And sometimes the things that I do, I shouldn't do. There's a war going on in my members all the time, Paul said. And that same Paul said that our citizenship is in heaven. Our conduct needs to follow the rules of heaven. And it would be Paul later on in his Christian life and in his Christian growth, he had got to the point that he said, 
I forgot about all those things that are behind and I'm pressing forward to those things that are before. And he was looking at the prize that was just in front of him and he knew when he made it, after he uh, left this body, that he was going to be rewarded in heaven. And he said to Timothy, uh, those, some of the last words that Paul wrote, I've fought a good fight, I've kept the faith, and I've finished the course. Henceforth, just out there in the future, there's laid up for me a crown of life. And not to me only, but to all of those that love his appearing. The Lord loves every one of us. And there's a reward waiting for us. If we're faithful in our citizenship and we're the, we are the example that God wants us to be in our society today. We are to adorn and decorate the body of Christ, the church, the kingdom, and what people see in us, that ought to draw them to the Lord. Finally, every salesman knows the value of showing a good product or a good example of their merchandise. God showed that example to all of us. The scriptures teach us very, very plainly and very, very clearly Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they might see what? Your good works. And what will happen? It will glorify your Father which is in heaven. So when we're being a good example or a good sample of Christianity, it glorifies our Heavenly Father, and our citizenship in heaven. That example is important. If someone came to your house selling a product, and they said, well, now this product will take all of that grease off of your cabinets there. Let me just show you. And they spray a little bit on there, and they wipe it, and it's worse than it was when they put it on. Then they spray it again, and it's worse than it was when they put it on. Then they spray it again, and they've got it smeared over the whole thing. Are you going to buy that product? No! But if he sprays that product on there and he wipes over it real easy and it all goes away, that's a product that you want to buy, right? So if this sample and this example that we're trying to sell, if people cannot see the effect of it, then they're not going to be eager to buy it, are they? So when our lives are put on display as a sample or an example in this world, people ought to say, I want that in my life. I want Christ in my life. If those people can live the way that they're living in the same world that I'm living in, I want Christ in my life. If those Christians can live without fear and without worry and with joy and excitement looking for the end to come and go home and be with the Lord, if they can have that kind of joy in their lives, I want that kind of joy. Because right now I'm filled with fear and worry and troubles and problems all around me of every type and every sort. Christianity is the sample that God wants the world to see that will draw all men to him. And Jesus said it this way. If I be lifted up, if Christianity, if the way of the cross is lifted up, Jesus said he would draw all men to him. All people would come to him. If we can just show a little better example of Christ in our lives to those that are watching our lives, more people will come to the Lord. This morning, Paul said, let your conversation, your manner of living, be as that that becometh or exalts or portrays or beautifies Christ or Christianity. Today, if you're here and you're not a Christian, you're still in a world of darkness. You're still in a world of sin. You don't have that hope of eternal life. You don't have that peace of knowing that your sins is forgiven. You don't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to bring you comfort and consolation and intercede with you when you don't know how to pray as you ought to. There's a lot of benefits to being a citizen of the kingdom of God. And in order to do that, you have to believe in your heart or your mind that Jesus really is the Christ, the Son of God. 
And you've got to confess that before mankind. And you've got to change your life, repent. And you've got to be baptized to have those sins washed away. And God will intervene, make you a new creature, add you to his family, record your name in the book of life, and set you on a different journey towards that eternal place called heaven. If you want to do that this morning, we invite you to come as we stand to sing our invitation hymn. We invite you to come. Receive the Lord into your life today. Yesterday evening, uh, Becky and uh, Jeff married each other, and today they're going to marry the Lord. Uh, they're going to become the bride of Christ.